It's found in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. And the Bible says there that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Uh, because it is written that curses is everyone who hangs on a tree. And it says that in verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And, and the blessing of Abraham, and we talked about this a little bit last week, talked about the blessing of Abraham. If you look into the uh, book of Genesis, we'll see there that the Abraham was tremendously blessed by God. He, uh, he followed after God, and he, he was uh, commended for his faith, and God blessed him so that he might be a blessing to, to the world around him. And we read scriptures there where it says that Abraham was blessed in, in all kinds of good and so forth. And then there was a, a miracle child that was born to him. And that miracle child was Isaac. And Isaac, uh, he followed in Abraham's footsteps. And it says uh, in, in Genesis uh, 26 that there was, in Isaac's day, there was a phantom in the land. Uh, Genesis 26, 1 says, tells that there was a phantom in the land. God was, well, we'll read uh, verse uh, 12 of Genesis 26. Then Isaac sowed in the land. And reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he was very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. And when we, we come, when we come to worship the, our wonderful Lord and Savior, we come and, and we, we bring our giving as well. We bring our, our tithes and our offerings. And that was a, a, a type of what Abraham did as well when he brought his tithe to the Lord. And God wants us in a position where even the world will envy us. And the world will look at us, and they'll not, not look at us as paupers who are down and out and so forth, but they will look at us as the people to be envied, envied, and they'll say, how come you got such a smile on your face all the time when we're going through all this confusion in the world? And uh, the, God wants, the, wants us to be the, the, the salt of the earth that will make the world thirsty, make the world thirsty for the things of God. But notice here that here Isaac sowed in a year of phantom. And he reaped a hundredfold. In other words, Isaac was sowing by faith when every, everything else looked really bad. He continued to sow seed. And that's the same way as you and I when we take and sow seed into the kingdom of God. Even when things don't look great, we continue to honor God with, with our giving. Uh, I remember back many years ago, Debbie and I were in Calgary, and we, had, uh, we were struggling very much financially. And we had lost our, our home and our farm and so forth, and we had moved to Calgary, and we were struggling very much. And so we, uh, we needed uh, every bit of finances that we could get. But I knew about the principles of sowing and reaping at that time. And on this Monday morning, I got a, a check for some work I had done for $1,000, and I knew that that wasn't going to go nearly as far as I would want it to go. But there was, it was $1,000, and I got it on Monday morning. And I thought, okay. I got this on Monday morning, and a tithe of that is $100. So what am I going to do? Am I going to be tempted all week to spend this somewhere else, or what am I going to do? So what I did was I called the pastor of our church, and I said, are you going to be around? Because I got this tithe, this $100 tithe, and if I don't give it today, I'm going to be tempted all week to put it somewhere else. And so I decided uh, I believed in the, in the ministry of sowing reaping, so I got in my car and took that over there. And, uh, you know, I believe I'm still reaping the benefits of giving today, still reaping the benefits of, of uh, walking with God, obeying God, always being, being faithful, uh, allowing the principles of the kingdom of God to take shape in my life. So uh, as you have come, many of you had come and, uh, during worship and, and given, gave this morning, I want you to know that you are sowing seed for the kingdom of God. You are sowing seed to reap eternal things because every time somebody gets reached with the gospel of Christ, 
There are eternal ramifications of that. And not only for that individual, but for others around them as well. And so with that, I'm going to ask you to give a real big, big, wel big welcome to Ernie and Joanne as they come to minister this morning. It's so good to be back on the island since before COVID. We, uh, we came before and we haven't been since. So this is just wonderful to see the family of God here. And um, even as I, uh, we were driving up this road, uh, loyalist? Yes. I, uh, we both felt, wow, this is a road that's being prepared for the king yes. and uh, the king of kings, but also for revival. Hallelujah. And so we really believe that this church is standing in the gap for this province, for this nation, and that, um, that the Lord is going to move uh, on the island and revive people. Don't we need to be revived? We do. Hallelujah. We need to be awakened. We need to be revived. We need the, the fire of God to come in us like never before, an increase of the passion for Jesus like never before. And then out of that place of intimacy, he will give us compassion. And I believe you do have compassion for those that are suffering, for those that don't know the Lord. I know we know Bill and Debbie. We, like he said, we've been traveling for so long together across our nation to pray, to intercede, to be watchmen on the wall. And I do believe that this church is called to be a watchman on the wall for this province and for this nation. So I just want to thank you for all your prayers for this island and for, for Canada. I felt the Lord gave me a scripture um, for you at this time. And it's, um, it's Psalm... Okay, it's Psalm 24, and uh, the king of glory entering Zion. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of it, the world and those who dwell in it. They don't know that, but he says the world and those who dwell in it are his. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the streams and the rivers. Who may ascend unto the mountain of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to what is false. Well, we know that many in the past few years have lifted up their soul to what is false nor as sworn oaths deceitfully. And we know that a lot of authorities in the land, in this land and many other lands, have deceitfully sworn. And so he shall receive a blessing from the Lord, those that have clean hands and a pure heart. And it's only by the blood of Jesus. Isn't that right? And the righteousness from the God of his salvation... This is the generation, description of those who diligently seek him and require him as their greatest need. So, Lord, we do. We want to diligently seek you, and we want to require you as our greatest need. And if any of us are not there, we can ask. And we ask now in Jesus' name. Who seek your face, even as did Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And so I believe you are a gate, and that you have responsibilities, and that the Lord wants to use you to even open up the gates. Open up the gates, open up the gates, so that many souls will come into the kingdom of God. Open up the gates so that revival will come upon this island. 
I believe that this ministry, this church has been placed here not by accident, but that the Lord is wanting to use you as a gate here in Eastern Canada and that the king so that the king of glory may come in the glory of the lord may come in to this island like never before who is then this king of glory the lord of hosts he is king of glory who rules over all creation with with his heavenly armies and i do believe that we and you are part of the army of the lord here on earth and now we are co-laboring with the Lord and he's releasing his heavenly armies to come and help us at this time in history. So I believe that the Lord is asking you now to stand in the gap as watchmen like never before on this eastern gates and open it up by prophesying, by making decrees and declarations that the King of glory is coming in in this island and in this nation. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm, suppo I'm supposed to be wired. Am I wired? Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh, I can't even hear myself. Oh, it's starting. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many here are excited about Jesus? No, no, no. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You need more excitement than that. We have to be sold out to Him. He wants all of our heart. A lot of us were keeping our heart back because of fear, because which is the number one enemy from the devil is fear. But God has given us faith to destroy fear. And we've experienced, and the whole world has experienced fear in the last two and a half years. But uh, I'm going to maybe touch on that today. But before I start, I want to talk a little bit about this book. I procrastinated four or five years before I wrote it. I didn't want everybody to know that uh, I was a drug, I was in drugs, I was an alcoholic, I was in the mafia. I didn't want anybody to know that. I was hiding that. I'd never shared that. And so the Lord says, if you publish your book, I will use it around the world to bring deliverance to the people who read it. And it's published in 2015. And since then, I've had testimonies all over the world because it's in France, it's in Germany, it's in Japan, it's in Australia, it's in New Zealand, it's in the United States. Wherever the Lord wants it, that's, it's there. And I didn't promote the book at all. Because as Jesus said, if you write it... See, when Jesus gives you an, a, a promise, you have to obey his, what, his direction. You'll never receive God's promise, and there's 3,000 in the Bible, until you first... Do your part. That's called faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. And one day the devil, the devil, not the devil, but the Lord told me, without fear, it is impossible to please the devil. So our choice is ours. Who do we want to please? Do we want to please the Lord or do you want to please the devil? Amen? Amen. So anytime the Lord speaks to me, and he speaks to me in this whole book. It's all miracles, this book, by what the Lord has asked me to do. Now, the problem with that is he usually asks me to something, do something I can't do. And that's where we miss the Holy Spirit. I'm sure he's asked some of you or all of you to do something you can't do. Why does he do that? Why would he ask you to do something you can't do? Because if you can do it, you don't need him. You don't need God. You just do your own thing. The other thing I've learned, is he'll ask us to do something we don't want to do. And again, this is a very, very important thing we need to know. God has all given us something very precious. It's called our free will. And the Holy Spirit and God will not come against your choice, your free will. He will not change your will. 
It's a choice that you make. I want you to know that. So if you're missing what God has for you, it's because you haven't chosen to obey, to do something you don't want to do. What example is there in the Bible? Well, look at Jesus. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't want to go to the cross. He was sent here as a human just like us, so he could be our example. And so the Father said, you have to go to the cross for my people so that they can spend eternity with us. That's why he asked Jesus to go to the cross. Jesus struggled. You're going to struggle when the Lord asks you to do something you don't want to do. It said that he sweat blood, drops of blood. But then, notice he said, but not my will, but yours be done. And every time we let go of our will and what we want to do and do what he wants to do and obey, there's a miracle waiting for you. Amen. That's my whole book. Amen. Obedience to the directives of the Lord. Now, why would he ask us to do something we don't want to do? Do you have, did he ever ask you to do something you don't want to do? Yes, many times. Again, he wants to see if you're completely committed. He says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, My eyes are going throughout the whole earth, looking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to me. So you need full commitment. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your obe obedience. Now my second book, which I just finished a couple of weeks ago, and the reason he, had, he wants me to publish it, and it's quite the story how, how he supplied the finances, I'm not going to get into it, uh, to publish it, uh, we worked many years with the homeless, so he used a homeless person to finance the publishing of my second book. Something I would never think he would do, but that's what he does. We try to figure out how God is going to do things. Forget it. It'll be different than what you think. Because he wants, him, he wants you to do it his way. And it's called Strange Miracles in the Marketplace Beyond Comprehension. Why the marketplace? That's where the kingdom of God is, in the marketplace. So in this season, I know, he's trying to get his sheep, the church, out in the marketplace to do what he's called them to do. That's what's happening right now. This is the season you're in. So if you're not in that season, you're not going to be able to benefit from what he wants to do in and through you. That's very important to understand. Again, well, I don't want to do that. You know, I go out there and I try to witness and uh, I'm, I'm rejected. They reject. No, they're not rejecting you. They're re rejecting the word, the word of God. It's not you. So the devil lies to you and tells you, you know, nobody wants to listen to the word. Nobody cares about God. No. And that's all lies. See, he's a liar. So I don't know why we waste any time at all listening to a liar. I don't listen to him anymore. It's over. It's over between him and I. So I hear from him very seldom now because he knows where I stand. He knows that because of what the Lord has done in and through me that I understand now how he works. And so uh, <clears throat> I want to share uh, uh, something. When, we, when, when the, the pandemic, or the pandemic I call it, hit, we were in New Zealand. And uh, we were supposed to come back in the end of April, May. May, yeah. April. Yeah. and we, we usually fly with Air Canada, and they cancel all our tickets. So we were stuck there because now we had to find another airline to come back to Canada, which we did, and it took, we never left till the yeah. end of May. And so we, got, we didn't get to Calgary until June 1st. Now, I knew because of that was canceled, and God had another way to get us there. I knew that he had changed, he had put some change in our ministry, but I didn't know what it was. So, we got back to Calgary, and then we, we confined for two weeks, according to the government. 
And so after two weeks, we went to the Lord and we said, Lord, I know you're, you're changing. There's some, there's some change coming here. But I don't have a clue what it is. Could you let me know? Whenever he gives me a, a, a directive, usually it's command because he's, he doesn't give us any suggestions. And when he talks to us, he gives us a command. Now it's up to us. You know, are we in the army of the Lord? He's, he's, the, he's the captain. He's, the, you know, you better listen because otherwise you're not going to benefit from what he wants you to do. So we said, Lord, okay, what is our next mission? We've been in Calgary for 40 years, ministered in Calgary for 40 years. Do you want to share a little bit, honey, on, on our, in Calgary and what was happening there and okay. how we got here? And oh. about the scripture that you oh, gave? Okay. I want you to participate a little bit, too. <laughs> oh, well, um, in Calgary, this was wonderful because, I mean, we left Quebec in 1979, and then we, we got to Calgary, and Ernie was really, um, he wasn't, we weren't saved. We got saved in Calgary, so it's been a great blessing, and we raised our children there, and, and uh, we went to church there. We served the church for 14 years, and then the Lord gave us our own ministry and church. And so we just really uh, grew and matured a lot during these years. We studied in the United States uh, for four years and graduated there under uh, Rama. Kenneth Hagen's ministry, which we love, and we are so forever thankful for the foundation of the Word of God, the Word of faith that is in our lives, because I believe that so many in the body of Christ have not had that foundation, and therefore, when the storms come, uh, they are very shaken. And so I, I think that I've heard some faith coming out of your pastor <laughs> this morning. And uh, he's put some of my favorite praise and worship music. And uh, he talked about Isaac in Abraham. the time of famine. I've been preaching that. It's time to sow in the time of famine. Because Isaac prospered, prospered so much. And anyway, even talking about the life of Abraham... That's what the Lord has called us to, to he was going to teach us to walk like Abraham. So our time in, in, uh, in um, Alberta was fruitful, and yet we experienced a lot of different things going on within the ministries, within the church. And, uh, but you know what? The key is forgiveness. If you learn to continually have a heart of forgiveness, whether it's for your marriage, with your children, at home, at work, in the ministry, with your brothers and sisters in the Lord, forgiveness will set you free from everything, even sickness, even disease, even, uh, I'm telling you, and the enemy, when we do not forgive, he steals our joy. I'm going into a rabbit now. A rabbit trail. trail. <laughs> but forgiveness, somehow. It's okay, so I said a snare. We, <laughs> we need to hear it over and over because forgiveness is a major key for us as believers in the Lord. So I want to encourage you with that. We've had to forgive. Uh, we were in full-time ministry, in full-time business. I started a French immersion play school over there, and uh, that's how I came to the Lord because we had rented a Pentecostal a, a basement in a Pentecostal church, and Pastor Chirelli, who was from Montreal, started praying for us. I got saved first, and then the more I prayed for my husband, the worse he got. But you know what? God is a God of faithfulness. And when you keep standing, Acts 16, 31 says, As for me and my house, we shall be saved. Yes. So don't ever let go of that for you and your loved ones and your family, your children, your grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and those that are yet to be born. 
God's Amen. blessing, we have been redeemed from the curse. And so now the curse is, break, is broken and we receive the family blessing that God has. And so thank you, Lord. <laughs> so we were back from, if I don't interrupt here, I might not speak again. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good, yes. It's very good because it's the word of God. Um, so when we arrived, from New Zealand, like I said, we were in confinement for two weeks. And I knew God had a change for our ministry, but I didn't know exactly what. Although I had an inkling what it was because he was kind of probing me for the last year to do something which I did not want to do. I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of, of you too that you don't want to do some things <laughs> God is asking you to do. So when God speaks to me, I always say, Lord, Show me in your word what you're asking me to do. That's my guarantee. You see, Jesus said he's even, he's even put his word above his own name. So the, this is it. I mean, you can listen to whoever you want. To. This is the final answer. And if you don't have an answer from here, I would wait. Because chances are you're going to go over a cliff or something's going to happen. Because when he shows you the scripture, that's your directive. That means that's his timing. So if you want to go before, you're out of his timing. And if you're out of his timing, yeah. ain't going to happen. I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. So we, every morning we'd get up. You know, we had two weeks to, to, to pray and say, Lord, we need to know. After we get out of this cage, we need to know where we're going and what you want. <laughs> And so every morning, like we still do, we do devotions together. And uh, I had opened my Bible, and it opened up to Jeremiah 10, 17. I used the New Living Testament. That's translation. Translation. This is the one Jesus wrote. Okay? You might have another one, but this is the one he uses. Because this is the one he speaks to me. Speaks to me. You see, I... There's so much revelation that he's given me and notes I have in here. You notice I have duct tape to keep it together. <laughs> but there's no way this Bible is going anywhere but with me. There's too much in here. There's too much he's done. So anyway, let me get back, get back to Jeremiah 10, 17. So then he told us, we, I want you, I'm sending you into the harvest field. To Quebec City, Quebec but specifically Quebec City and the Maritimes, to work in the harvest, my harvest field. The laborers are few. You have the right background. You have the right languages. That's why I'm sending you. So I said, well, show me what we're supposed to do, when we're supposed to do it, <coughs> and why. That's good questions. Eh? That helps you when you know from the Lord what, what's in his mind. So in his translation, in Jeremiah 10, 17, it says, word for word, pack your bags and prepare to leave. The siege is about to begin. Now, I didn't quite know what, this, what a siege was. So I looked, up, I looked up the siege. Siege is a prolonged and persistent effort to overcome an existing resistance. In Quebec, and I know in the Maritimes probably also, there's a resistance to the gospel of God. In Quebec, only one half of 1% of the people are born again. It's the biggest mission field. I mean, we've been overseas, and, <coughs> and there, there are mission fields there, but right in our backyard, he has a mission field, yeah. and that's where he's sending us. So within four days, we were in Quebec City. Once I know what he wants, I don't procrastinate anymore. Okay, honey, let's pack our bags. We're, we're leaving. And that's what we did. And we did a, a three-month tour of Quebec and the Maritimes three years ago. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit divinely connected us with some 12 different ministries that we didn't know of. And so when we obey... 
The minute we say yes, I want you to get this. This is a key. The minute you say yes to his directives, the responsibility of it happening is no longer yours. It's his. It was his idea. That's his plan. And you're willing to say yes. Now it's his responsibility. We want to work with his plan. Now, I, I must have prepared three different messages for today. And every one of them was canceled by the Holy Spirit. So that, again, said, well, Holy Spirit, you have something particular that you want to do tonight or today. And that's why uh, we always, 40 years we've been ministering together. The only time she doesn't allow me to minister with her is when she's uh, with a ladies ministry. I don't blame her, you know. <laughs> so anyway, we in Calgary, we started to be known as the Siamese twins. We spent 40 years. We went to four years Bible school together. We did everything together. We've been stuck together, married for 48 years. That's a miracle. Because we're very different. We're very different. And so iron we are, sharpens iron. We are. Iron. We, are. <laughs> we climb the mountain on Two a different, different side. side. But then somehow we meet up there and we say, okay, not what he says, not what I said. What are you saying, God? <laughs> Is that happening to you guys? <laughs> and so, yes. Pastor Bill, remember I sent you a, a message about three weeks ago. And I said, I have an excitement in my spirit to come to PEI and to be with you. But I don't know why and I don't know what. But I have that excitement in my spirit. Well, let me tell you, that excitement is still there. That's why he wouldn't let me use my messages. He has a message. So he knows the Holy Spirit. He's our best friend. He knows everything. He's our teacher. He's our provider. He's our advocate. That's a French word, did you know, for lawyer, advocate. And so he, he wins all our cases yeah. if we obey him and do what he wants to do. So I'm excited, but I don't know why. I still don't read, really, but I, the Lord knows, and that's all that matters to me. Amen. You know, there's another thing that I do know this morning. Most of you, probably all of you, don't know me. And vice versa, I don't know you. But that's not what's important today. What's important today is to get to know Him, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, in a way that you don't know Him right now, based on what He wants to share, whatever He's going to share. Uh, let me know if it works. <laughs> so, hallelujah. Amen. I love He's my best friend. Amen. He's everything I will ever need here on this earth. And He should be also to you. But it's all to do with relationship. Relationship. When we're saved, when we're born again, our life no, no, no more belongs to us. Some people don't, you know, don't realize that. Once you get born again, your life is no longer your own. He says, my, my sheep hear my voice. You came here with your car, my car. Who owns the car? You do. My sheep. Who owns the sheep? He does. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. He didn't say, you know me. He says, I know them, and they follow me. Let me ask you a question. Are you going to follow somebody you don't know? Are you going to follow somebody you don't trust? So what he's saying here is, I know you. I know you. I created you. I know you better than you know yourself because I created what makes you tick in your life. You know, I think that's a word. Makes you thick, tick, thick. And so he knows you better than you know yourself. And he wants to use every one of you here in his kingdom. Because my Bible says, believers, are you believers? Yes. Believers will lay hand on the sick. Believers will cast out devils. Not believers will stay in the church for 40 years. 
No, he, this is the season he wants to get us out in the market. Where did all of Jesus' miracles happen? In the marketplace. That's why he wanted me to bring this book at this time. I mean, I, I finished it a couple of years ago. But this timing again, timing. So he wants you out there so that you can experience him personally because he wants to work in you and through you. And it's like the disciples that went out. Jesus sent them out and they came back. To, wow, the, even the demons, you know, obey us. They're all excited. Well, you want to get excited? Go out in the marketplace. We should all be in the marketplace. I know, since we're in Quebec, every day we're on the streets. Anything that moves, we, we witness to it. We give them the word of God. We tell them about God. And sure, some reject. But they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the word. That's another key you need to realize. I got a few notes here because I, I don't want to take off and, 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 and don't come back. You know, <laughs> Because when I start, what happens? Like you're talking about a rabbit trail. That's what happens when we minister. Uh, you know, I'd love to have a meeting for four hours. I'd love that. But, you know, the people that are listening, they probably wouldn't be able to endure that. Because when I'm sharing, I'm sharing experiences, personal experiences, not something I heard from a preacher, not something I read in a book, personal experiences. Let me tell you, what happens when you have a personal experience? We read the word, we memorize the word, and it's all up here. It's called head knowledge. It's called the logos. And it's useless up there unless it doesn't come down here. But the only way to get it from here to here is to become a doer of what you know. One day the Lord told me, you don't know what you don't know. And that's true. There's a lot of things we don't know. But he wants us to experience what we know by becoming a doer of what you read. It's exciting. That's the way we walk. That's the way we live. And you know, you were talking about seed. You know, planting seed. But you know, every time you plant a seed, you don't get another seed. You get a whole bunch of seed. And many times when you go to a service, any service, and they take an offering or whatever, and, uh, well, I can't, I can't afford to sow. You can't afford not to sow. Because if you don't have enough money to meet your need, it's no longer your need, it's your seed. So change your need, what you have for your needs, put it in a seed. Then you'll have lots to meet all of your needs. Not only then, but in the months to come, in the years to come. These are all principles that... Uh, Yes, we read it all in the Bible, but do we do it? You're never going to experience the power of God working through you till you do it, become a doer of the word. But where we miss it, because he asks us to do something we can't do. He asks us to do something we don't want to do. So we say, forget it. I want to do my thing. I want to do my plan. <clears throat> Hallelujah. The other thing I want to know, do you want to, anything you want to say in that? Another thing I want to, these are all keys and I call them secrets that the Holy Spirit has showed me. And, you know, I'm sure he gives his secrets to other people. Maybe you've already heard it. But I hear a lot of Christians that come to the Lord and say, oh, my Lord and Savior. He's my Lord and Savior. And then I look at their fruit in their life. I say, no, he's not your Lord. He's your Savior. And you didn't even run around trying to get saved. He found you. He's your Savior, but He's not your Lord until you make Him Lord. That's why your life is no longer your own. You say, Lord, I make you Lord of my life. My time now is your time. Is it easy to do that at the beginning? No, I mean, I'm talking about 40 years walking with the Lord. And the other thing you mentioned is Abraham, like Abraham and Isaac. We talk about that all the time. And that's what the Lord has done over these years is teach us how to walk like Abraham. He just says go. He doesn't say where. And that's what he does with us. Go. You will never know what he wants to do through you until you get there. But if you never go, you'll never experience what he wants to do. These are all principles that we need to learn and, 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 and operate in it. 
So I don't know where we're going from here. Um, another thing, another thing that's very important. Seems like my book says we all hear voices, and we do. We all hear voices. Once we have that personal, intimate relationship with Him, now He wants to speak to you. A lot of people they pray and they dump their problems on the Lord, and then they leave and go to work. If you're going to dump something on the Lord with your, what you're concerned about, at least be decent enough to, after you finish dumping on Him, take 10, 15 minutes aside, quiet, and let Him give you your answer. See, we, we're in a rush to, because all we're thinking about is, well, I got to do this, I have this problem, and run, run, run. Jesus never ran. Jesus never ran. And we here on this earth are representatives of Jesus. And the works that he did here on earth, which are not finished, we are to finish. And so if we're to finish his works, then we need to operate like he operates. Right? That works. He, his, every time he prayed, it worked. Why? It says that he didn't do anything Unless he heard the Father tell him what to do. He didn't say anything until he heard the Father tell him what to say. And that's my goal. That's where I want to be. Am I there? No. But you know, if we all operated in that, we'd see a little more silence like we have right now. <laughs> because we'd only say what he wants to say. And you know, if, if, if the Holy Spirit shows a person, me a person here and he says, Go tell him this. Well, you've got to obey. Because do you know what he, he wants to say? No. But go, and when you get there, open your mouth, and he'll fill it. That's how the Lord works. Yes, yes, yes. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's murder against the flesh. <laughs> the flesh doesn't like it, but we shouldn't operate in the flesh. See, <clears throat> we, we are in the natural realm here on earth. We are in this earth. We're in this world, but we're not of the world. So anytime we want to work with the Lord, we need to get out of our natural realm and go up to his supernatural realm where he operates from. Did you know that? That's where the miracles happen, in his realm, in the supernatural realm. How do you get from here to here? You obey and say, yes, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I'll say yes, and you go up to his realm. Now he's going to do it in his strength, in his ability, not yours. We're limited in our strengths and abilities. Not by might, nor by power, but by, by my might. spirit, says the Lord. Amen? Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. I believe this is an hour, this is a season when we need to walk by his spirit like never before. Be led by his spirit. This world is growing darker by the minute. We talked about that with Debbie and, uh, and Bill yesterday, you know, even concerning children and what they are now teaching children in the schools and, and what's happening with our children, with the younger generations. And so we need, I see, I see a lot of people that are... Um, older uh, than, the, than children, than the younger generations, <clears throat> and God is not finished with you. He is calling you to walk with the younger generations. You have a lot to yes. give and to <clears throat> impart to the younger generations. The Lord is not finished with you yet, and, and he's not finished with us. That's why we're here. You know, we, we have our children and grandchildren living in Australia and New Zealand, and when we were, we left New Zealand to come back to Canada, and, and we had to go into confinement, and the police came to our door to check up on us, and all of these, uh, these things uh, that, are, that were taking place, we were seeking the Lord. You know, <laughs> we want to get out of this nation because it's not going very well. But yet, you know, uh, then you repent and you say, okay, we know, Lord, you're calling us to this nation. You're calling us down east and we're going to go. And when we left 
uh, and we were blessed by apostles and prophets and pastors uh, out west, and they released the blessings of the Lord upon us. We came, but as we were leaving Calgary, we felt that we were going into the lion's den in <coughs> Quebec. And it, it was, it took place, you know, with curfews and all the, the restrictions and the way that people were treated and all of that. Anyway, the Lord is saying to us, older ones, you are a part, a very special part, a very important part to the kingdom of God and to what he wants to do here on this island and on, uh, in Canada and on the earth. I mean, watchmen on the wall, God can put us on, in a place where all of a sudden we intercede for another nation. You know that. And so there's, you're here, but yet you can be in many places by the Spirit of the Lord to intercede and to stand in the gap for what? God wants to do in the earth for this hour and season. And so now is not the time to retreat. In Hebrews 10, at the end of the chapter, he says, God does not take any, any pleasure in us retreating, going backwards. And so the Lord wants us to advance his kingdom. And you are a very part of it. The younger generations, he wants us to walk together. And so we need the older people with the wisdom of the Lord, the maturity of the Lord, and we need to be on fire as well. But the younger generations are needed, and we need to walk together. And I believe that that's your desire. Amen? Amen. And so thank you, Lord, for that. See, one of the commandments says, honor your father and mother. But there are fathers and mothers right now in the kingdom of God yeah. that you need to hear from. They're the ones that have been around longer than the youth. My heart is for the youth because I lost 37 years of my life. And I don't want them to go through what I had to go through. For 20 years, I served the devil, and he tried to kill me six times. But I don't want them. I want to let them know they don't have to go through that. And so that's my heart. So I, I'm always drawn to the youth. In Quebec, same thing. You know, we see youth fishing. We'll go up to them and sit down and talk to them. Mm -hmm. But uh, let me just go back uh, for a second on this uh, pandemic. <clears throat> because it's been with us for two and a half years, right? So I said to the Lord, what, what, what's going on here? Where are you? What are you doing? Looking at what's happening, I don't see you in too many places. And he said, <clears throat> this pandemic, he didn't say that, he, I say that. <laughs> he says, this pandemic is a test for my churches. And what a test it was. I says, that's fine, Lord, but give me a scripture. You know, it's fine to hear something, but is that really from? So he gave me this scripture. Jeremiah 10, 21. Now, the churches don't like the scripture too much, but that doesn't matter whether we like the scripture or not. This is what the Holy Spirit not only likes, but wants. And so it says, The shepherds of my people have lost their senses. I saw that. I've known pastors, and they must have lost their mind what's happening, what they're doing. You can't come in a church unless, you know, you're, you have your... You, you know what? <laughs> Let me read it again. The shepherds of my people have lost their senses. They no longer seek wisdom from the Lord. Mm. Why? Because a lot of us, we haven't made him our Lord. Did you get that? Yes. We had to make him our Lord. We have to be sold out to him. We don't move. We don't do anything till we hear from him. Now, some, uh, there's some pastors, you know, they didn't hear at the beginning, you know, they said, oh, this is only for two weeks. Well, two weeks turned into two and a half years. So at the end of two weeks, you either did something about it or you just went with the flow. I noticed a lot of them just went with the flow. But that wasn't God's perfect plan for them. And that's what, so what did he do? 
See, it says, if you don't praise the Lord, the rocks, I'll use the rocks to praise me. So he went to the church and he says, okay, who are you going to listen to? Whose authority are you going to listen to? The government authority that has been elected by the people or the absolute authority, my authority, and what my word says? That's what he did to the churches, okay? But that's not what happened. So what did he do? He, he didn't see the, play, the churches take their place. So he said, don't worry. Instead of rocks, I'll call the truckers. <laughs> and so he used the convoy to replace the churches. And I'm telling you something. I spent three days in Ottawa with the truckers. And I never sensed so much unity and the presence of God ever even, I didn't, I didn't ever feel this kind of unity, even in churches we've been in. So you see, if we don't do what God wants to do, he, he'll just put you aside. He says, okay, I'll use these. I'll use that. I mean, everybody was shocked. Now, how do I know it's God? Well, it didn't stop in Canada. It went around the world. See, God looks at the whole world. We, we know, even with our personal relationship with him, he, has a, he wants a personal relationship with every one of us. And he does that with the whole world. If we can just fathom the power he has, the love he has for each one of us. I mean, in my book, he, he pursued me for 20 years. I cursed him. I hated him. I blamed him for everything. But he pursued me. Amen. So, you know, we have to obey what the Holy Spirit says. Just a minute, one more thing, a little note here on the way here. Yeah. In Nahum, I've never seen this before. In Nahum 1.7, it says, God knows those who trust in him completely. Mm-hmm. Remember I gave you 2 Chronicles 16.9? If you trust in him completely, he will give you all the strength, all the power, everything you need, To fulfill your destiny. He controls my destiny. He controls your destiny. Whether you know it or not. He has a plan for each one of you. You know there's three plans. There's three voices. Uh, My book I talk about the three voices. There's your voice. The voice of God. The voice of the devil. Well in in God's plan there's three plans. There's your plan. God's plan. And the devil's plan. Mm. And uh, and not long ago we were in in Quebec. uh, on a, on a beachfront, and uh, the Holy Spirit says, you are a product of the choices you made for your life. Did you know that? If you don't like where you are, go in the mirror, ask for forgiveness, and let him do what he wants to do through his plan for your life. Amen. Now, getting his plan is a whole other message. So I'll have to come back some other time. But he has a plan for each one of us. I'm just going to give you two scriptures, a revelation that the Lord gave me. I don't want to keep you too long, but if if I get going. (laughs) Two scriptures. This is the revelation he gave me on these two scriptures. John 10.10. That's the devil's plan for you. uh, I don't usually talk on our plan because our plans are all different. We all have a different plan. But you know what? The plan the devil has is the same for everyone. And the plan that God has is the same for everyone. But he's specific. He'll tell you exactly what he wants you to do. So, the three voices. The scriptures. 10.10. John 10.10. I'm sure everybody knows. The devil's purpose. Or we could say the devil's plan is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose, or we could say, but God's plan, is to give you a rich and a satisfying love, life. Mm -hmm. A life of love. Mm -hmm. His love for us. So, we see here that he's he's here to kill, steal, and destroy all of us. Mm -hmm. Have you ever wondered what is he trying to steal? What is he trying to kill? And what is he trying to destroy? Have that ever crossed your mind? It did me many times. I didn't, it took a while to get an answer. He answered me by giving me the scripture, 
2 Timothy, I'm sure it's here somewhere, 1-7, one, seven. Seven. 2 Timothy 1-7. I have not given you a spirit of fear. Devil operates with fear. But of power, love, and a sound mind. The devil comes to steal. Steal what? The power. The power is the authority God has given you that to defeat the enemy when he comes against you. So he's trying to destroy, to steal that authority that God has given you. That's the scripture. Then it says to kill. What is he trying to kill? The love, the unconditional love that God gave us. He's petrified about it. Why? Because the Bible says, love never, never, ever, never, ever fails. You see? So he's going to try to kill the love of God that's within you. And the last one is destroy. He wants to destroy what? Our sound mind. Look what happened during this pandemic. How many people committed suicide and, 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 and lost it, you know, in their mind. The fear, the fear. So he's destroyed, their, he's destroyed their mind. But that doesn't have to happen if we know his plan. And again, you know, I could spend a lot of time on his plan. But I, and I have probably 20 scriptures on his plan. Mm -hmm. I might just give you one or two okay. if you want to endure a little more. But these sure. things, well, I mean, you know, our, 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 our seats sometimes, you know, uh, wants us <laughs> to leave. <laughs> Listen to this, Jeremiah 10, 23. I know, I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. Mm. Do you know that? We are not able to plan our own course. Mm. But our mistake as Christians, and I was business from 1983 to 2018, we have a tendency to plan. And so, you know, at the beginning, I'd make, uh, I'd try to, well, you read my book. <laughs> That's not in there. God didn't tell you what I, what I planned. I just told you what he told me to do. But I used to make a plan. And, and I'd make a plan. I'd say, Dad, that's a good plan. And I'd bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, bless it. Bless this plan. I'm serving you. Bless this plan. He said, I'm not interested in your plan. <laughs> Find out what my plan is. It's already blessed. And you won't have all these pitfalls. And you won't fall because it's my plan. My plan is perfect. Amen. That's a lifelong thing to know his plan. And so, again, it's worth the time to find out what really his plan is for our lives. Amen. Go ahead, Tani. I guess what I wanted to uh, share is about the spirit of fear and the spirit of confusion. I believe that we really need to guard our hearts and mind like never before because if that's all over the world in the spiritual realm and it's not over the enemy wants to steal, uh, kill, steal, and destroy. And he wants to bring the church into a place of fear. And many in the church in the past few years have been in fear and, uh, and, and confusion as well. And the church should be on the cutting edge of what God is doing in the earth and hear what he wants to do and, and uh, stand for what he wants to do and decree it. May, take a stake in the ground and just say, yes, Lord, we're not going to go into fear and confusion, but we're going to trust you with our life, and you are the one who is our deliverer. You are the one who is our provider. You are the one who is our healer. And you are the one who will protect us at all times. And as we confess and speak the word of God, this is what is happening 
to our lives instead of saying, I'm in fear, I'm in confusion, and uh, even thinking about it, meditating on it, and it's becoming a stronghold in individuals' lives, but also in the body of Christ. And we need to be set free of this in the name of Jesus, that the Spirit, God has not given you and me a spirit of fear and of confusion, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And this should be your confession and my confession every day because of what's in the world at this time in history, the enemy is releasing more and more of that uh, spirit, those spirits of fear and confusion. And so you need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our hearts and mind and declare and decree uh, what God says that he has given to us. We have so much more than what we we, we, we know we live at this level and God wants us to live in a much higher level where we are not limited, but we are continuing to advance the kingdom of God and go from glory to glory and faith to faith. I think uh, <clears throat> Joanne has touched on something there that we need to deal with a little bit uh, to a greater degree. I want you to stand with me for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Uh, this spirit of fear, yeah. as Joanne was, uh, was speaking that, I just sense that uh, <clears throat> a lot of times I don't feel that, I don't feel that spirit of fear, just deal with it. But I just sense that uh, in, in the room today, there's some people who, you know you're dealing with that. You know there's just some things in your life that, that has caused you with, with, with all the things that are happening around us, with, with all the stuff that we're hearing today, that that spirit of fear can grab a hold of us. And uh, we need not to be ashamed of it, we just need to deal with it, yes. rather than just uh, walk in it. And I, I believe that we're, gonna, we're going to have even more uh, propaganda come to try to uh, more reviv uh, re revive even any spirit of fear that was sown in the past, they're gonna try to revive that. And I think that the Lord says, I, I, wanna I want you to deal with that, and I want you to deal with it now, so that we can come before him without any uh, fear blocking our uh, relationship with him because the enemy operates in this area of fear and God, of course, operates in the, in the area of faith. So uh, if you know that you're dealing with that, you know that you're dealing with that spirit of fear, I want you to, I want you to come up here. Yes. And I want to, Joanne and, and Ernie to, to minister to you. Uh, if you know... That spirit of fear, some way, somehow, has, has gotten...